springs, as we've learned about in Hooke's law, uh, exert a force if you try to extend or compress them. And although the coils of wire to make a spring, like we have in a box mattress, are somewhat idealizations in physics, there are many objects in nature or that are man-made that have springy-like uh, behavior and can be modeled with a spring-like force, as in Hooke's law. The idea of a binder clip where we have to press really hard in order to open the binder clip, well, that binder clip obeys something like Hooke's law. Some of the soles of our, our shoes are bouncy in behavior, and in fact, there is a Hooke's law-like relationship between the amount by which the sole of a shoe compresses and the amount of uh, force it takes to compress that sole. The bow and arrow that we see in, in the movies, it, it has a Hooke's law or springy-like force because the more you pull on the bow or draw the bow out, the stronger the force that you must exert. And of course, there are things like a pogo stick, which have exactly a spring at, at their core to make them bounce up and down. But many objects in nature are elastic and have a springy-like nature to them. Even something as hard as a baseball or a baseball bat actually compresses like a spring. It has a, a springy-like behavior, as we'll see in the following movie. A baseball bat is one tough item, but how tough? What really happens when bat meets ball? And why does the bat sometimes break? Even the Time Warp Lab has its limitations, so we decided to pay a house call to another lab. This is the only place in the country where you certify the bats and the baseballs in the major leagues. Welcome to the University of Massachusetts Lowell Baseball Research Center. Here, Patrick Drain will show Jeff and Matt the scientific reason for broken bats. And to do so, Patrick uses this crazy machine. What we basically have here is we have a bat hanging here vertically. We're going to fire with an air cannon a ball at 160, 180 miles per hour. Let's see what the collision looks like. Let's go from there. We're loading the machine with a regulation wooden bat made of ash, a longtime favorite in the big leagues. That's way too fast to see. Now to whip some ash, time warp style. Okay, yeah, that's good for focus. We're all set to fire. You ready? I'm all set up. Okay. At 10,000 frames per second, we can see the regulation hard balls turn into squash balls when they hit the bat. And right here, you can see the ball is actually starting to wrinkle. Right, it has to go somewhere. That, to me, looks like a fake baseball. Yeah, that's, that's a real Major League Baseball. If I just saw a frozen frame of that, I would think that you really destroyed this ball. This is about a third of the ball compressing almost flat. That would take, you know, 50 or 60 of me standing on top of one of these to make right. it compress like that. Or a couple cars. Or, we hasten to add, a professional ball player. So the ball's not even as tough as we thought. But that just makes the sight of a splintered bat all the more mysterious. What gives? Clearly the ball, but what else? So in this shot, we see the full bat. And the bat bends too? This makes me feel like every single piece of equipment in baseball is made out of rubber. It's totally unexpected, because we look at a bat like this, and it feels totally solid. Yeah, when you have a long object like a bat, it is going to have the ability to bend. We're seeing some vibrations that extend all the way into the hands. So every time I hit a ball, I feel this sting going through my arms. And I think it's hard for people to understand what that sting is, but it's really these vibrations that are going back and forth really, really fast. What happens if these vibrations get too much for the bat to bear? Okay, see. Now we're moving an inch and a half, two inches further out. We're going to fire it at about 150 miles per hour, but that's actually replicating a 90-mile-per-hour pitch and a 60-mile-per-hour swing. Now we're going to move away from the proverbial sweet spot that lies about five to seven inches from the end of the bat. Load the next one in.
There you go. When the ball hits outside the sweet spot, the bat vibrates even more. You only change where we impact it by, what, three or four inches? And the bat is almost in an S shape at certain points. That's an amazing amount of vibration. And what if we move it just a bit further? Can we create that bat-breaking surprise? Okay, it's firing. Oh, it's broke. broke. Say it ain't so, Jeff. You can really see when the bat starts to break, all of the energy of the ball has gone into breaking this bat. It's much more common that the bat splinters a little bit than to actually split apart. Well, we all know by now that here at Time Warp, the uncommon is commonplace. Well, okay, we got lucky. Just as the ball is making full contact, we're seeing that the bat is starting to break. It's not that the ball is harder than the bat, far from it. But when a batter misses the sweet spot, the force of the ball makes the bat vibrate and bend so violently that it splits at the weakest point, often along the grain. Snap, crackle, pop. In fact, even atoms and molecules at the atomic level are be behaving like springs. Oxygen in the air, as, as found in the air, is actually O2. It's a, it's a molecular bond of two oxygen atoms, and the bond behaves like a spring. And if you were to be able to observe at a very small scale what's happening between the two oxygen atoms, they would be vibrating back and forth as if they were held together by springs with it, like a dumbbell. Something like ethylene, which is you know, found in, in methylene groups, or made of methylene groups, the bonds here are vibrating as springs. And in fact, there are multiple kinds of springs. The, the single bond between a hydrogen and a carbon atom uh, acts as a somewhat weak spring whereas the double bond between two carbon atoms acts as a rather sp strong spring. This kind of principle is, is validated or verified by looking at the light emitted by such molecules, which is going to be emitted in such a way that the frequency of light is, pro is proportional to that bond strength. In fact, the principle of these molecular bonds behaving like springs is the principle behind a very fine microscope, something like the atomic force microscope. In the atomic force microscope, a tip is run over a, sur a, sur a surface of some material and makes a scan. And the tip of that, uh, that object is interacting with the atoms in the surface with these kind of spring-like forces as bonds temporarily form and then break as the tip passes over. And the way that's detected is to have the tip of that probe stuck on the edge of a long piece of flexible metal, again acting like a spring, and that's called a cantilever, and one detects the motion of that cantilever by reflecting light off of it, like a laser, into a photodetector. And so one is using the spring-like forces between atoms to actually measure the properties of the surface. So there are lots of things in nature that are not exactly coiled up pieces of metal like a spring, but we deal with them in physics by modeling them with something like Hooke's Law, and it turns out that's an awfully good approximation to model many things in nature, everything from baseball bats to pogo sticks to molecular bonds.